reminds you of uh, what's on the board. And uh, this picture is from a real life experiment. Okay. So, of course, this picture is much more complicated than this picture. And, uh, it's important to point out, as you said, real life experiments. Nowadays, people do experiments on computer, computer simulations. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Right, that's true, that's what true. So, in fact, in fact, there is a new keyword for that. You know, some people in, in conferences <laughs> also, I have heard they call them numerical experiments. They literally use this phrase. Oh, what is? What in? What is that supposed to mean? Oh, in silicon. Oh, in silico. Oh, that's weird. That's abuse of Latin in all manners. So. Oh, in situ. Yeah. I see. I see. Oh, I see. See, I'm already behind you guys. There's a generation gap. So. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Okay. Right. So, okay. This is a brief recap of what we did in the last class. Okay. So, what we did was we started from a very simple problem, which all of you are familiar from your study of quantum mechanics. So, the simple harmonic oscillator, and then we directly calculated uh, the expectation of n, where n is uh, basically telling you the average uh, uh, index of uh, the quantum number, where the things are labeled like this, right, and so on, right. And we saw that magically, we got out a Bose-Einstein distribution here, right. And then, of course, we asked, is there a better way to understand it? Because uh, sometimes there are mathematical coincidences, but uh, those occurrences are rare. So typically, whenever you see such things, there is a better way of uh, demonstrating the physics of it. And in fact, in this example, the better way of dem uh, demonstrating the physics was, as we saw, by using these uh, creation and annihilation operators, right? And uh, then we saw that this literally looked like a boson problem and it had the right algebra. And we could use this to get basically everything. And uh, this also helped us understand this, right? Uh, why there's a uh, Bose-Einstein distribution here, right? So that was one thing. The next thing we did, uh, and then we sort of ran out of time, is uh, uh, take two very simple problems and uh, 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 sort of understand the quote unquote normal modes of that. Uh, so basically, if you take problems where the Hamiltonian is quadratic in both x and n in p, then there exists coordinates in position and momenta, which are known as normal modes, where the problem becomes just a bunch of non-interacting harmonic oscillators, each with different frequencies. And uh, for problems where there is translation symmetry, you can label each of those oscillators by its own momentum. Okay, because momentum is a good quantum number in those cases. So then f for the very simple case where uh, there are these, for example, particles connected by springs, we could obtain this uh, dispersion for the uh, normal modes as a function of k. And uh, then, of course, we highlighted the fact that uh, a very interesting thing happens here, that there are normal modes uh, whose uh, frequency uh, basically goes to 0 near k equal to 0. So, uh, the bottom line is that there are gapless excitations in this system, right? Because it creates a very small amount of energy to create an excitation near k equal to 0, right? And that gap can be reduced to be as small as you want uh, as you move to k equal to 0, right? Good. Okay. Then we said, okay, let's take a slightly more complicated lattice. So, we took that where instead of one kind of springs, we had two kinds of springs, if you wish. Or if you want to think of an alternate situation, maybe instead of, maybe you can keep the springs to be identical, but say that there is mass m1 here, mass m2 here, m1, m2, and so on. That also you can do, right? So then we realized that uh, here, the dispersion was slightly more complicated. Uh, uh, it had two branches. Of course, the reason it has two branches is clear because uh, when you sort of write it in momentum space, uh, you have to use a two point uh, unit cell and that unit cell is repeated and that's why you get two branches. If you took a, a problem where maybe I don't have two colors, but three colors of springs and I keep repeating them, then I would have three branches and so on and so forth, 
right? So of course, in a real crystal, uh, there are the unit cell may be very complicated, things like that. And then, of course, in a real crystal, you would expect many branches, right? But uh, the important thing here is that, again, there was a branch which actually uh, uh, became gapless when the momentum became close to zero, right? Exactly like this problem. Of course, there's also a branch which is always gapped, right? And we discussed uh, why this is called acoustic, why this is called optical, so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I just now said. Yeah, yeah, like two sentences back I said that. Right. Please pay attention. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So, right. Now, uh, in the harmonic oscillator problem, we also calculated the specific heat, right? If you remember, and that was a very easy calculation, and we got some complicated form, but uh, this complicated form gave us two simple limits. At high temperature, we got uh, Kb out of this, and that's of course correct, because in the classical limit, which is what we recover when we go to high temperature, uh, this is quadratic and this is quadratic, and you know that there is something called equipartition theorem, so you will get half Kb from here and half Kb from here, so you add them up and you will get Kb for the specific heat at high temperature. Good. At low temperature, we got the following relation, which the important thing is, uh, there is an exponential in temperature, right? So minus h cut omega divided by kbt, right? So the specific heat is exponentially low at low temperature. And we in fact said that this is a general property of systems which have uh, gaps from the ground state energy, okay? So, and in fact, if you look at the low temperature specific heat, uh, in principle, you can extract the gap from there. Good. However, there is a very well-known experimental fact that for insulators, for insulators, the specific heat uh, is not uh, n times kb, which you would have naively expected from uh, equipartition theorem. Uh, in fact, it decreases to zero as temperature goes to zero, and it decreases in this particular way, pq. Okay, and that's sort of a universal fact. It's true for most insulators that we see around us. Okay, so then we plan to understand this statement today, right? So that's essentially the recap of uh, yesterday's class. Okay. So, before I start discussing things, if you have any questions, you can please ask. Well, we haven't seen it yet. We'll show it in today's class. Right. We'll show it in today's class. So, right now, we haven't seen it. We have just calculated this, but this is for a single harmonic oscillator. Now, we'll see what happens if you have a bunch of harmonic oscillators with omega k like this. And each of it is like an independent boson problem, and we'll sum up their energies, and then from that we can get specific heat, right? And the reason, see, this is important to appreciate. The reason you don't get an exponentially small specific heat should be clear to you, is because the gap is going to zero here. See, this is the thing to stress, right? Suppose I gave you a dispersion curve, which basically, okay, maybe I use some other color. Uh, Let's say I gave you a dispersion curve, which did not look like this, but look like that, right? And this same curve, right? But it sort of goes like this, right? Then, even without doing any calculation, I can tell you that the specific heat won't be T cube. It'll be just, uh, let's say this gap is delta. It'll just, at low temperature, be E to the minus delta by KBT. That's it. Okay? It can never be of this form, right? Okay, good. Uh, but we learned, at least from these two calculations, that that is not the case. And in fact, what I told you without giving any proof is that uh, for a crystal, there will always be some gapless excitations because a crystal spontaneously breaks a symmetry when it forms, and that's a continuous symmetry of translation. And whenever you break a continuous symmetry, uh, you get these uh, gapless modes, which are called Goldstone modes. I did not prove it, I just stated it, but this is a general uh, uh, thing for uh, these kinds of continuous symmetry breaking. Any other question? 
Oh, so Goldstone modes. Goldstone, because uh, among other people, there were many people who sort of proved this roughly at the same time, that if you have continuous symmetry breaking, you get these kinds of gapless excitations, but somehow the name of Goldstone got associated with it. That's always the case in science. Many people somehow, okay, this is an accident, but okay. Yeah, Goldstone was one of them, but there were many other people. Then it's quadratic, then it's k square. Yeah. Correct. That's also important. Yes, that's also important. So, as PK said, suppose this harmonic thing is not there, then it's just a free particle dispersion. You know what it is, it's k square. But because, because of these, uh, the dispersion changes from k square to k. That's another important uh, thing to uh, keep in mind. Okay, good. Any other question? Okay, good. So, now let me show you a complicated curve. This is actually the phonon dispersion of a real uh, uh, element. This is actually germanium. Okay? And I have taken this figure from this particular paper. Here is the reference. Uh, so, in case somebody does not believe me, somebody can open this paper and see. Uh, right? And basically, this paper, these two authors were trying to explain uh, uh, from some first principle calculation, the experimental results of these two authors. Okay? Uh, so, this experiment was in 1972, where through some neutron scattering techniques, they obtained these dots. So, using some experimental technique, they could actually obtain in germanium what is the phonon dispersion curve. Okay? And these are these dots, these dots. And these lines are from uh, this theory. Now, please notice one thing, as we just now discussed. I mean, of course, in a real crystal with a very complicated unit cell, you can have many branches, right? That's now what I just said. So, of course, in this thing, there are many branches. But please notice something which we discussed right now. Whatever the complicated thing is, there are these linearly dispersing modes, which are gapless. So, everybody can see those linearly dispersing modes here, right? They are here and they are here, right? And you can also see the analog of these optical branches. So, they are these guys, for example. Right? Good. So, yeah. So, for any complicated uh, insulator which forms a regular crystal, this is always true. Okay? And then we will cons uh, cons uh, construct an effective uh, simple theory which just takes uh, into account the fact that there are these linear dispersing modes. See, suppose your temperature, you're looking at a low temperature property. You're looking at the specific heat at low temperature. Then, you see, it's enough to just take this structure into account. You don't need to worry about all this complicated structure at high energy, right? And uh, then you can just construct a theory which takes this into account correctly, and you will get this answer correctly you'll get this T cube dependence correctly. That's what we'll see. Of course, this coefficient in front may slightly change because you have all this high energy stuff here, but uh, that's it. See, uh, I'm using low energy, high energy in the sense of uh, uh, the temperature sets a scale here, right? If your temperature is T, then of course, if you're looking at an energy E, which is much, much greater than KBT, that's like high energy. Right? Because there is a very small probability of uh, uh, making, there is a very small probability of occurrences of those states. Right? So, yeah. So, the important thing is if you are at low temperature, uh, then what is important is this lower part of this figure. Right? And then if you just look at the lower part of this figure, it is incredibly simple. Right? So, that is another very useful thing to remember about condensed matter. Right? I mean, when you are trying to understand a phenomenon, you should ask yourself what is important and what is unimportant and you should try to throw out the unimportant stuff. Because if you keep everything into something, normally it is impossible to solve it. I mean, that is a fact of uh, mathematics, nature, life, everything, right? So, yeah. Oh, I did something. Maybe it did not like, uh, anyway, but that is okay. Uh, I, uh, oh, press the button. Would that? Oh, thanks. Okay, good. So, this is what we will try to understand, but I will also give a small prelude to what another phenomenon we are going to understand. So, this is one phenomenon we will understand in this lecture, hopefully, or part of the next lecture, but another phenomenon which we will also understand 
is uh, this other thing of Bose-Einstein condensation. This is some picture which probably everyone has seen, uh, I think, right? Because somehow uh, uh, I remember there was a time when I used to go to any seminar, whatever the speaker was talking about, the speaker would show this picture. <laughs> so there was a time like that. But anyway, so this is uh, basically a picture. Uh, so this is a remarkable experiment. So what happens is that uh, there is something called laser cooling. Okay, and using laser cooling, uh, you can go to fantastically low temperature for quantum gases. Okay, and then uh, Cornell and Wyman first uh, could achieve this incredible feat of cooling a bunch of rubidium atoms to, please note the temperature, 170 nano Kelvin. So that's incredibly small, right? I should have maybe not used the color red, but it's incredibly cold, right? Okay, so, right. Uh, good. And then soon Ketterli and collaborators also uh, could see that this condensate at this very low temperature was really a Bose-Einstein uh, Bose condensate. So what is the meaning of that? So those graphs sort of uh, show you the velocity distribution in momentum space. Now you remember from your coursework that uh, suppose I have a classical ideal gas, then the velocity distribution follows a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which looks Gaussian, right? And see, you can see that this guy, this guy looks more or less Gaussian. This so this, uh, this guy on the left is basically what the velocity distribution looks like before this bunch of rubidium atoms have condensed into a Bose-Einstein condensate. Because here the temperature is the tuning parameter. You have to go below a certain temperature so that this happens. Above this temperature, you would not get a condensation. Now, we'll in fact calculate this temperature in one of our lectures also, and you'll see it's not very hard to calculate. Uh, uh, now, below the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, something very interesting happens. What happens is that there is a macroscopic occupation of uh, one of the K modes, which is the K equal to zero mode, the ground state mode, the mode with the lowest energy. And that actually shows up in this blue guy spiking up, right? So see here, this is sort of at an, this is like near this TC, near this Bose-Einstein condensation temperature, and this is below it, and you can see that this guy is spiking up, right? So it's really eating up all the weight of the Gaussian distribution, right? And this was sort of the first experimental demonstration of the Bose-Einstein condensation by uh, these gentlemen, and of course they were soon awarded the Nobel Prize for this, these three gentlemen. Right? So we'll also learn how to uh, think about these things. Right? But today we'll just, uh, first in this lecture, we'll just focus on this and uh, its consequence. Good. So now I don't need this. Now I'll just go to the board. So can I, how do I switch it off? I mean, no, but, oh, I'll leave it. Oh, it doesn't create any problem for the recording, right? Okay, then it's okay. I can leave it. But look at the board, don't look there. <laughs> right. uh, can you like, how can we get such exact? Like, what, what oh, to? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, so, right. I mean, uh, they, of course, uh, so there is a complicated lattice. At one level, they did some harmonic uh, approximation, but then they had systematic waves, uh, ways of improving on those harmonic. Uh, 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 what should I say, uh, approximation. So they took, it's like you have a unit cell and they, they sort of keep enlarging their unit cell and then they can, so now you say, oh, maybe this is my unit cell and I should consider more interactions. Then you get more structures emerging and so on and so forth. So there is some systematic way of calculating that. I frankly have uh, never done that myself because I'm just happy to see this thing and I know that I roughly understand. That's it. <laughs> but but there are systematic ways of these are called ab initio methods, yeah. But uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. There is a huge community which. Uh, in this paper. No no no. So the theory was already developed. These two authors, uh, Wei and Chao, they actually applied it to this problem. But uh, there's a big community which uh, works on that, right? But for me, the important thing is that 
<laughs> this is there, right? I mean, if I worry about all kinds of things, then I mean, you cannot be good at everything and you cannot understand everything. That's it. So, right. So, I can recommend you this paper and you can read it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, now we'll go to our calculation on this board. I'll keep this here. But before I start calculating stuff, I'll actually sort of give you two homework assignments. They're both very simple. So, please do them. I mean, it'll be to your own benefit. And uh, if you're stuck, you can ask me tomorrow and I'll try to help you. But hopefully, you won't get stuck. So, one of the questions which I got during the discussions after my lecture was uh, what happens if uh, this uh, harmonic oscillator is not harmonic, maybe it's anharmonic. Of course, you can still write this representation and the nice advantage of this representation is as PK was also indirectly saying in his talk. See, once you have this algebra, you, may, you don't even need to know the wave functions explicitly to calculate many things. So, that's the power of this representation. Right? So, let me give you one small problem first to calculate, uh, which you should do at home and please try to do it today and you can then tell me tomorrow. We can discuss the problem more tomorrow. Okay? So, this is exercise one. I mean, of course, if you do these simple exercises, you get more hang of these things, right? Because otherwise, they might look very, what, what's the right word, uh, uh, abstract, abstract to you. Right, so. so, now let me just define this oscillator problem with exactly the same parts, but I add another small piece. So, the small piece is this term, this term, right. So, this makes my oscillator anharmonic, right, and I further assume that lambda is much, much smaller than 1, okay. So, then what I'm asking you is, of course, then if this happens, without this term, you know that the energy of each eigenstate is uh, this, right? But with this term, of course, the energy is going to shift slightly. Now, my question to you is, calculate the first order shift in energy, right? So, the term which is order uh, uh, this perturbation, right? So, that's the first order shift in energy. but Calculate it using the method of A and A dagger. So, that's very easy. I mean, I can just give you a quick hint and then you can try to do the calculation. Uh, essentially, essentially this shift uh, boils down to, uh, of course, you need to insert factors here, uh, boils down to calculating matrix elements of this form, right? Matrix elements of this form, right? From first order perturbation theory. What I'm asking you is, Please express x in terms of a plus a dagger and then just use the commutation relations that we have written there. And maybe you can also note down these two relations. Okay? And just using this without even explicitly knowing the functional form of n, you should be able to uh, derive this correction for an arbitrary n. Okay? So, please try this and it will be helpful. So, that is exercise 1. Everybody understood the exercise? We can deal about how to do it later, but you understood the exercise, right? So, you should use that technique to do this problem, okay? Of course, when you write this in terms of A and A dagger, you will see that this problem is no longer a free Hamiltonian. It has sort of A dagger, A dagger, A, A kind of terms and so on. And then I will go to the lecture, okay? And I am giving the exercises to you now, so that you have some time to do it and then we can discuss it tomorrow, right? I mean. I mean, this was my problem. So, I am a very slow person. So, normally, uh, when there used to be these one or two or three hour exams, I used to be very terrified. But somehow, I managed through my school and college education. Okay. So, but you see, when you go to your room, you will have lots of time. You will have nobody staring up upon you. So, then you can do this, right? So, right? Okay, good. So, exercise two. Uh, Exercise 2 is, you remember, so spin half and it had a very simple Hamiltonian, uh, sorry, uh, which was this. I put a label 1 for a certain reason now. Uh, so, then we calculated for this that uh, S1, Z expectation was, can somebody recall what the result was? So, uh, this is some very standard result. Uh,
Yeah, tan hyperbolic, I hear murmurs. Right? So this was the result. Good. Now, two spin halves. So then there is another term here. Now I add a third term here. Uh, sorry, let's S1 dot S2 with a plus sign outside. So this is like an antiferromagnetic interaction between spins, right? This term. So you understand what this term is, right? So this term is just uh, in terms of these uh, quantum operators, it's just S1z, S2z plus S1y, S2y plus S1 x s2 x. So, please calculate the partition function for this and please also calculate what is s1 z and s2 z. Right? Good. So, again you understand the you do this yourself and then try to understand the various limits of this uh, uh, beta and h and there is also another factor here uh, j if you wish, but I have put j to be 1 what defines small and what defines large and so on and so forth. Okay, so these, but uh, so far so good. Anybody has any problems? So, afterwards I realized that there was some confusion with the, this derivation and why. Now today let me give you an alternate derivation very quickly. So, it is a very small alternate derivation, but right. Okay. So, now I will erase all this, right. I yeah. Let us uh, do a alternate derivation for for whatever uh, we were tackling yesterday. So, I said that uh, the situation that we are imagining is that there is a crystal and basically the atoms of the crystals are doing small fluctuations about the equilibrium, right? That was the model. Now, because the keyword is small fluctuations, I could therefore write a uh, quadratic uh, theory. So, basically there is a kinetic term right and then there is a potential term uh, and these uh, okay, these fields are if you wish the displacement fields. So, the displacement from the equilibrium position right. Now, of course, I stopped at quadratic order. So, first question why is there no linear piece here if I expand for around the crystal uh, positions why is there no linear piece? Yeah, because it is at equilibrium. So, the first piece I will encounter is this and of course, I will encounter higher order pieces right order. Uh, so, this is a shorthand q cube right. So, 3 q terms q 4 and so on and so forth right. But in the sense of a Taylor expansion, this is the first term I will stop at, right. And uh, this theory is a is a free theory, right. So, we can write them in terms of normal modes. So, let me very quickly tell you what I would do in terms of this and basically I will just recast this as a problem of matrix diagonalization and in the last two classes of P k you have heard many things about matrices and their manipulation. So, you are all masters of matrices. So, from now on I will try to cast everything in terms of matrices and then everybody would understand right. So, right ok good. So, here of course, uh, first question is what is the algebra of uh, these guys. So, what is this what is on the right hand side of this yeah that is correct. So, similarly this is also 0 right. Now, what is this? <laughs> I did not even finish it yeah. What is this? Huh? No, but there is also something before delta i j. Huh? Right, right. So, please do not forget factors of i and stuff like that right i h bar <coughs> delta i j right. But, so, the format is this. Uh, so, let me just do this casting. So, Q scaling uh, these displacement fields by square root m in the denominator. Why did not I put something like an m for example, in the denominator right, because I want these new variables to also be new coordinates and new momenta right, some redefined and uh, okay, the last thing is uh, I need instead of v i j, I will define a u i j. 
And uh, this is very straightforward. So if you do all this, then your Hamiltonian just becomes slightly simpler. That's all. I mean, it doesn't have these factors of m and all sitting. That's the only reason I did it. This, this is your Hamiltonian. Now you can see what's going to happen, right? See, this thing is yet not in the harmonic oscillator form, right? This is not in the form qi square, right? But this is exactly in a matrix form, right? If you think about it. So there's a q, there's a u, and there's a q. And this u is a symmetric matrix, right? This u is a symmetric matrix. Uh, so then, of course, you can do a similarity transformation and just uh, go to another basis where there are some tildes and then the matrix sitting in between becomes diagonal, right? So that basis is your normal mode basis. That's it, end of story, right? So hopefully this is uh, less confusing for the people who got confused in the first approach, right? So then we just write that thing. So there is some linear transformation, yeah, which you know how to get, uh, which just depends on this definition uij of this matrix, uh, which is like that, right? There's some linear transformation like that. Good, okay. First question, if I want to go to this Q alpha tilde, right, of course then this thing becomes quadratic, right, this thing becomes quadratic and in terms of Q alpha tilde whole square, right, but should I do something here, what do you think, this is already quadratic, but should I do something here, what do you think, do I have to, do I don't, no, sure, uh, will be preserved, are you sure? So try to see the commutation relation of this object with pi. Mm, you should try this and it won't be preserved. So I have to also, I have to also transform my pi because I want to again preserve my commutation relation, right? So yeah, so you just do exactly that. But you already know this, so then you do this, right? And then that's it. Then the general Hamiltonian that you get, so of course this matrix would have all real eigenvalues, right? Because it's symmetric. Uh, right? Uh, so I said that the eigenvalues are real, but why am I also insisting on the fact that the eigenvalues are all positive? Uh, does somebody know? I mean, why am I insisting on that? Why are all the eigenvalues positive? Because I have ri written some real number whole square. So that's a positive number. So why are all the eigenvalues positive? <laughs> Sorry? Um, no, I mean, uh, it's just, uh, that just gives you the reality condition. Uh, why is it positive? I mean, uh, just think a bit. What are we originally doing and it just comes out from there? Huh? No, no, I mean, this is just some mathematics I'm doing here, right? So then, see, of course, the eigenvalues are all real. That you can get from here. I'm asking another question. Why are they all positive? No, 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 I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> no, that's, you yourself understand that's not a satisfactory answer, right? So why are they positive? Very simple question. Just think a bit. Look at this thing. What are you trying to do? And then it's immediately clear. So you are expanding about some state. What is that state? No, no, no. Equilibrium or the minimum energy solution. And you're expanding around that. You're perturbing around that. So, of course, uh, all the directions should be restoring. So, all these numbers should be positive. If any of these numbers is negative, in fact, that's a good point. See, suppose, suppose you took a problem and you said that uh, this is my equilibrium and I, let's now ignore the square. Some of these numbers, you get them to be negative. Then, what does it immediately tell you about your... So, that's actually a good check of even your calculation, right? I mean, somebody say you start with the wrong state and you do an expansion. Then automatically the theory will tell you that your expansion is, none of them is negative. That's enough to tell you 
that there is some other state which is lower than the state, right? So please remember this. Because uh, sometimes when we do a lot of mathematics, we don't, uh, uh, yeah, we tend to even forget some simpler things, right? But yeah, this is a very simple fact. Okay, good. So then we are back to square one. Then of course, you see, I'm back to the problem I started with, bunch of non-interacting harmonic oscillators, because now this is one harmonic oscillator, right? Exactly like, oh, sorry, I erased that. Oh no, there etc etc and I can get independent harmonic oscillators each with this frequency omega alpha right no 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 see this is the diagonal matrix so when you do the similarity transform the diagonal matrix the, the identity matrix will stay identity it's an identity matrix so think of doing the similarity transform so it will stay identity you can check it yourself it will stay identity. Yeah. Okay, good. So everybody is clear about this? Okay. Uh, the uh, source of your confusion is C. Let me remind you, these C alpha i's are not arbitrary numbers. Uh, there is some constraint. I mean, just think of your linear algebra and then it will come out. They are not arbitrary numbers. Okay, good. That's the crystal. That's the crystal because uh, QI and QJ are deviations from the crystal. Yeah, that's the ground state. Right. So here the ground state is easy to guess. But I was just making a general point. Correct. 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 That's the ground. Of course, quantum mechanically, yeah. Of course, of course, quantum mechanically, that's not possible because PI and QI cannot be simultaneously zero. That actually has an interesting consequence. So the minimum, see, classically, the ground state has zero energy, but the minimum energy for this quantum system is the zero point energy, right? Now, if you have a system in which the interactions between the atoms is so weak, uh, it's even weaker than the zero point energy fluctuation, then that system would not even form a crystal. So an example of that is helium. You go to a very low temperature and it won't form a crystal. So that's right. It wouldn't come out classically because classically you expect it to form a crystal. Okay, good. Okay, so now I go here and I erase this. Uh, I hope everybody has noted down these exercises. Please do them. This is for your own benefit, not for, not for my benefit. No, that is of course not known. Probably if you go to extremely small temperature, probably it will crystallize, but it's some very small number. Yeah. If, if it's non-zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, let me go to my analysis. So now we'll calculate the specific heat. Okay. So tomorrow in one of the lectures, uh, I'll sort of convert that lecture into a tutorial and I'll discuss sort of 2D Ising models and mean field theory. Uh, and then in that tutorial section first, we'll discuss these two problems and uh, if you have any other problems, okay, and uh, yeah. Okay, so now coming back to the specific heat. So let's see. So now. Uh, so basically this n is the number of, uh, so I'll, okay, let me draw the coordinates here. Let's say k b t is 0 and this is also 0 and this is 1. Okay, why am I drawing it like this? So, uh, so let's say you have a crystal in which there are n unit cells, right? Then classically what do we expect the uh, specific heat to be? Classically we expect the specific heat to be uh, 3 times n times uh, k b t sorry kb so let me also divide by kb here right classically because uh, uh, you can have uh, like 
in a solid, you can have polarizations in any direction, right? And so that's the factor of three. And then the factor of KB comes because you have a half KB from kinetic energy and half KB from potential energy term. And there's N because these are sort of N unit cells, right? Now you can have a unit cell which has a more complicated structure inside. It may have a two point basis, three point basis, four point basis, whatever. Then let's say the whatever the number of points are in your basis, you also can multiply it here, right? So if you have a simple crystal, then this number might be one. If you have a more complicated crystal, this number might be two, so on and so forth, right? This is just the number of uh, entities inside your unit cell to define the Bravais lattice. That's it. Okay, good. So this is what you expect classically. So let me just erase this for convenience now. Okay, so then classically everything should just remain at one, right? But what people observed experimentally very soon was if they did the actual experiments, they saw something like this. They saw some behavior like this. Okay, so at high temperature, it seemed that it was approaching one, where I have divided it by this, like this. But at low temperature, it was strongly deviating from this classical result, very strongly deviating from this classical result, and it seemed to be, in fact, approaching zero. Okay, so that was the observation. And then people really tried to understand it. People like Einstein, people like Drude, so on and so forth, right? Okay, good. So then, uh, let's see what they, oh, I should not have erased uh, anyway. Uh, okay, so, so let's see what they did. Uh, so, so I said that typically in your system, if you look at the phonon dispersions, you might have things like this. Of course, it actually looks even more complicated, but you might have things like this. So the first attempt to explain the specific heat of a solid was made by Einstein, and he adopted something called the Einstein model. Yeah. Correct. Correct. That is true. Yeah, that is true. That is exactly true. That's true. No, but if you think of the problem really classically, for a quadratic theory, the specific heat, independent of temperature, is always a KB. I mean, you just calculate the partition function and just see it. It's always, it's a constant. It's independent of temperature. Right? Because even at very small temperatures, you can still do lots of fluctuations. In yeah. So you solve it and you'll get it. That's the equipartition theorem, right? So, right? so there is some crucial thing missing. And of course, now we know what it is. But at that time, people didn't know it. So, right. OK, so what Einstein did was, I mean, he started with a model which is an approximation of this complicated thing. Of course, in a real life situation, you saw that it's even more complicated, right? So Einstein started with the following model, where he said that this is my dispersion, literally. So everything is at omega e, e is for Einstein. He did not <laughs> call it that, but let me use this nomenclature. So basically, he just said that this is my spectrum. That's it, he just said that. So basically, there are n modes in my crystal, and all the modes are oscillating with uh, the same frequency, omega e. Now this is a very simple problem to calculate. Uh, so probably in your notes somewhere, you have the answer written for a single harmonic oscillator, right? So the answer for the specific heat here for multiple harmonic oscillators is just n times the answer for single oscillator at that omega e. So this is the property of that oscillator, right? Is this clear to everybody? Uh, I hope I don't need to do any calculation. So there are these n oscillators here. All of them, oh, maybe there are fractals of three and all, because uh, they have three directions possible. But that's OK. I mean, uh, so you see, the important thing is that there are these oscillators here. All of them are oscillating at omega e. So, and they're not interacting with each other. So, of course, what is the total specific heat? Just n times the specific heat of each individual oscillator. And we already know the functional form of this. I wrote it down there and I erased it. But, yeah. So, see, that thing, as you remember from last class, correctly went to the classical limit when temperature was high. Right? Good. So, this part is correct. But that thing 
How did it go to low temperature? Uh, what is your guess? How does it go to low temperature? It's going exponentially. So how should it go at low temperature? What should I write here in the exponent? So the oscillators are oscillating at omega e. There's only one possibility. This is how it goes, right? This is how it goes. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we know experimentally, OK, so it's at least going to 0. That looks nice. But experimentally, it was soon realized that this was too steep a decrease. It doesn't go like that. OK, so then we were again back to square 1. At least Einstein's theory explained that something is going to 0. But it's not going to 0 correctly. OK, good. So then we needed some other kind of uh, approximation which correctly captures the physics. So just when I was writing h cross omega e by kBT, I realized something which I didn't point out to you. So let me go to that experimental graph again. <laughs> let me just go there. Yeah. So oh, okay, good. So does do people notice what is the y scale here? Terahertz. Terahertz, right? Uh, so does it tell you anything about uh, uh, the bandwidth of this problem in terms of temperature? Uh, okay, so let me rephrase it. See, there is a frequency here, right? And this is the order of that frequency, right? Now you can take any frequency, right? And from that frequency, you can get the correct omega, correct? And from that omega, you can get an energy unit. Correct? And then you can convert it into a temperature unit like this. Correct? So now, if you have something like a terahertz there, whatever the numbers are there, if you do this calculation yourself, you know all the information here, right? If you do this calculation yourself for, let's say, one terahertz, and then you just see these numbers, typically these numbers would turn out to be of the order of 100 to 1,000 Kelvin. OK, so that's a very useful calculation to do. So immediately, just by looking at the experimental data, you know that this width is roughly of the order of uh, 100 to 1,000 Kelvin, right? even without doing any microscopic theory. right? So these kinds of things you should appreciate uh, when you see these kinds of uh, peculiar numbers. OK, good. So that is all that I wanted to show. Restress again. Because when I was writing this, I just realized this. Because of course, you can convert it into uh, temperature units. Right? OK. Good. Where? Which C? Oh, here. Uh -huh. Of course, of course. You're absolutely correct. That is there. But you see, this is an exponential factor. This is the dominant piece. No, no, of course. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, whatever is your answer here, you just multiply by n, and in Einstein theory, you'll just get that. Yeah, but the dominant piece is still exponential. You're correct. There's a 1 by t square. Yes. OK, so now we move to the improved model of Debye. See, can somebody tell me why Einstein did not get the right specific heat at low temperature? Answer is very clear from here. No, no, that's correct. All frequencies are same, but there's a still a like even more basic reason why he didn't get it correct. You're correct. All frequencies are same is a bad approximation. But I'm going to make an approximation even here. Correct. So Einstein missed all this weight. This is the thing which significantly contributes to specific heat, right? Uh, so Einstein, in his approximation, missed that. But Debye did not miss it. In fact, his approximation was built on this. And therefore, he get, got the correct p cube. Of course, the prefactor that Debye got, you should not literally take it. Because uh, he used some model, and uh, the prefactor is specific to that model. But the fact that he got a t cube is independent of that model. Because as I said, at low temperature, your system just cares about this part. It doesn't care about all this thing sitting here. And Debye's model had the one essential feature correct, that this is gapless. And the second important thing is that this is linear. Omega is linear in K. So any theory 
in which you incorporate this would give you the correct low temperature answer. That's it. Please remember this. This is an important thing, right? Any construction you make which has gaplessness and has the right, what is the right word for it? Dispersion, right? Dispersion, right? Dispersion. I mean, if you started with the dispersion which went as k square, for example, free particle dispersion, then you would not get the t cube correctly. Then you will get some other power. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, you will get t to the 3 by 2. Okay. So, so that's important. So these two things are important. Good. So what did Debye do? Debye said, okay, I don't know about the very complicated things about the crystal. Of course, Debye knew it. I'm just putting it like that. I mean, so he said, I don't want to care about uh, the very complicated details about the crystal. Let's say we are just looking at uh, long wavelength uh, 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 modes in a crystal, right? Then whatever is the structure of the crystal is not so important, right? Because you're looking at the thing at a very long wavelength, right? So the fine details of the crystal are more or less unimportant then you can replace the crystal with just an isotropic solid. And we know that in an isotropic solid, you get sound modes, right? And the sound modes have the property that omega is linear in K. That's the property of sound waves, okay? So that's exactly what Debye used, okay? Good. So Debye said that uh, you have an isotropic solid. So Debye's approximation is the following. So see, there are a series of approximations here. This is Einstein's approximation. This is Einstein's approximation. The real thing may be very complicated. Maybe there are even like more than one branch. Who knows? Actually, in the picture we saw, there were more than one branches, right? So maybe there are multiple branches here, right? And some things here also, whatever, right? This is very complicated. So Einstein's approximation was this. Device approximation was, can somebody guess? What should I draw here? What should I draw here? What is device approximation? I already told you the answer. What? Correct. Linear. Absolutely linear. See, no curvature even near the zone boundaries. Absolutely linear, right? Because Debye said, let's just replace it by a completely isotropic medium. So, absolutely linear. So, this was Debye's approximation. Of course, the key thing to stress is both of these are approximations. But this would give you some physics uh, correctly qualitatively. But if you want to absolutely match numbers, I mean, this may fail. Because as I have illustrated, this is an approximation and this is an approximation. Okay? Good. Uh, okay, we are doing sort of okay. Right. Okay, so now I said that omega is, uh, uh, let's say some v times k or actually c times k. So, C is the velocity of sound, not the uh, speed of light, okay? Good. So, now again we do our standard thing. We have a cube of length L cube. So, the linear dimension in each side is L. And then we take periodic boundary conditions. That gives us a, a discrete bunch of momenta because of the boundary conditions. And uh, right, we then can convert from uh, k space to omega space just by using this relation, so on and so forth, right? So, let's do those simple things. So, number of uh, allowed momenta between, see now the problem becomes very simple, right? I hope you can realize that even before we start our calculation. So, Debye said this is my curve. So, I know that at each, I know that given a k, this is my omega, right? I know this. And these are independent harmonic oscillators. So, I know that, uh, I know uh, what is the average energy for each harmonic oscillator at a temperature T. I'll just add them up. That's it. And then I'll differentiate that answer with temperature and I'll get specific heat. So, what is the only thing that I need to calculate a bit carefully? See, when I just give you this spectrum, right? Remember I told you that there is this notion of a Brillouin zone here. So, one way of thinking about the Brillouin zone is that uh, effectively there are only n modes here, capital N modes here and that is what the Brillouin zone was restricting here. But this was based on a microscopic calculation. So, I was sure that there are n modes here. But now I am replacing it with some approximate model. 
Now I have to tell you what is an omega max here. I hope you realize what I'm trying to do, right? I have to tell you what is an omega max here. I cannot let this curve run ad infinitum, right? Because uh, then there is an infinite number of modes. That's impossible. I should have n modes, right? So I have to sort of place a cutoff omega max. This is actually traditionally called omega debye, so omega sub de, okay? And basically the property of this omega sub de is if I count the number of modes inside, then I'll get in. That's it, right? So once I get that omega max, uh, that's what the target is, and then everything else will follow. So that's the only free parameter here. Okay, good. So I hope now it's clear, right? Because I need an omega max. Without an omega max, of course, the <coughs> okay. So what is this number of allowed momenta? This is simply this we have seen many a times. This is simply this. Okay, right. And uh, then, of course, if I have a function in k, then I can use this property and convert it in an integral in k. Because, of course, if my system size becomes very large, the spacing between consecutive k decreases uh, as 1 over L. right? And then I can replace this sum to be an integral. Right? So good. So this is all OK. Now, this is the number of modes between k and k plus dk. Now I want the answer between omega and omega plus d omega, right? Because I have to then count the number of uh, possible modes and right. So that's also very easy. I mean, I just use this relation and I can do that. So basically, if you wish the density of modes is uh, just this. Uh, in fact, when I write this, I'll also insert a factor 3 here just to account for the three polarizations. Okay. So, yeah. as always, I insist you to check my algebra. I may make mistakes of factors of 2 and 3 and whatever. Uh, but yeah, this is essentially the thing. Now, these are the number of modes that I have, right? Uh, between omega and omega plus uh, uh, d omega, right? So now, I need to do an integration here, and that integration should be equal to 3 times n, the total number of uh, modes in my system, right? Uh, so can somebody tell me what is the lower limit of the integral and what is the upper limit of the integral? Yeah, 0 is obvious because we have gapless modes here. We have to start from 0. That's the most important thing. And of course, as I said, we want to cut off the integral at omega d. So that this count is correct. That's it. So this integral will determine omega d, right? There's nothing else here, right? So that I'll do. Uh, so while doing this uh, calculation, I'm adopting basically the notation of Kirsten Huang. Okay. So if there are some uh, confusing steps, you can always also refer back to Kirsten Huang. <laughs> so now there's another notation I introduce: this small v, which is volume per unit cell. So volume of the total sample divided by the number of units, small b. Okay, so this is another notation I introduced. So let me keep this here and let me erase that part. Speed of sound. As I said, it's not the speed of light. So c sub s if you wish. Uh, so c sub s. So then, um, you can actually do, you can see. So omega max or omega sub d, <coughs> I use them interchangeably, is uh, the following. C sub s, 6 pi square by v, the power 1 by 3. Okay. So I just solve that integral and I get this answer. right? So I know omega sub max, huh? okay. good. So now, what else do I mean? I just recall the result for the harmonic oscillator problem that I got. Uh, so I remember what expectation value of n was for the harmonic oscillator. It was this, right? So this you recall from the last class, we got this, right? 
So, this was the calculation for one harmonic oscillator. Now, I just write the total energy for the system. And when I write the total energy of the system, I will ignore the zero point energy. Because the zero point energy does not depend on temperature, right? And therefore, it won't contribute to the specific heat. So, I will ignore that part. I won't write that part. Okay. So, then of course, uh, your sum will have a structure like this because there are three n modes in my problem. Each mode, let us say, has a uh, omega i, omega sub i. So, this is the contribution from each individual mode. Why? Because this piece, uh, this piece is the energy of the mode and this piece is the expectation n. So, expectation n times h cut omega i gives you the total energy, right? This is, I hope, completely clear to everybody, right? Good. So, then the, I do the usual trick. I already told you what is the uh, uh, density uh, f omega d omega of uh, what is the number of modes between omega and d omega like this. So, I just use that result and just write this as an integral, right. So, So, the integral will of course, go from 0 to omega max and now comes the integral which I will just write carefully slightly. Okay. Okay. So, far so good. Also, uh, traditionally and this is also written in many experimental literature from this omega max people define a temperature called a scale called the Debye temperature scale. Okay. Suppose I give you the omega max, how can you get a temperature scale? You can just sorry h cos omega max is k b t t Debye right and this is actually a number which uh, many experimentalists quote. This is called the Debye temperature and the Debye roughly. Okay. So, basically what does this temperature scale indicate by? If you are much below T Debye, uh, so I just plot this graph again, uh, T cube behavior and so on and so forth. So, this is like a relevant temperature scale in that sense. Okay. Good. So, now we need to do some bit of mathematical jugglery but it is not very complicated. So, let us just do that. Uh, Kirsten and uh, Kirsten Huang. So, you can see the steps there, but I will explain everything. It is very straightforward. Okay. So, so, first I want to define some dimensionless parameter like this. So, this parameter is clearly dimensionless, right? This is clear to everybody. This is a pure number. This does not carry any units. Okay. Good. So, then I just uh, write everything in terms of this t. I can do that here and then after you do everything carefully, you should get the following. No, anyway. So, all I did was use this redefinition and express everything in my integral in terms of this uh, t okay, and then you get this. So, if you do it carefully, you should get this. Okay. I do not know why there is this static, but anyway. Uh, so, now Uh, it is actually more convenient to just try to analyze this integral on the side. So, let us define. So, this is called uh, in many textbooks, this is called the Debye function, what I am just going to write down. So, you can see 
why I wrote it like this right because look at this limit this limit is some beta h cut omega max and that exact same thing is coming as the third power right and of course I need to pull um, three powers from here inside but essentially it's this form right and then there is some one power of temperature hanging out right so if I get this form if I know what happens to this d then of course I know what happens here right good okay so now we'll do the usual thing we'll f so this integral is a bit messy uh, I don't know whether there is a straightforward way to calculate it for all x Uh, yeah, that uh, well, no, no, no. There is x here. Please remember that there is x and this x depends on temperature. This x so depends on temperature. So okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it is not so easy. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not bore you. <laughs> right. Uh. See, it is a funny integral, right? 0 to x and the x contains uh, beta. Okay. And there is an x here. And there is a t hanging around outside. Okay, so let's do the integral in the two limits that we always do things in <laughs> x much much less than one and x much much greater than one. Okay, so uh, if x is much much less than one, what does it tell you about the temperature? If x is much much less than one, then beta is much much less than one, right? So t is very large. Okay, and the other limit is of course the other way. Around. Good. Okay, so if let's first start with this guy. X is much much less than one. Then how should I approach this integral? I mean, what do you think? So just try to do it. Just tell me the steps, and I'll follow you. How should I do it? I need to simplify it, right? Because this is uh, not obvious how to do this, <coughs> or whatever order, right? So, this is clear, right? See, x is small, that is your integration domain. So, t is always small. Because t is always small, therefore, e, e of t I can do 1 plus t plus t square by 2 factorial plus so on, right? I can do that, right? Good. So, let us do that. Then it becomes a simple integral because then there is some power here and then I just take it to the numerator and So, let us just do that. So, basically it is t plus t square by 2 factorial plus so on. Let us just stick to uh, this order. Okay, let us say I just stick to order 1 to t. Then you see what is happening here. There is a denominator which is t. Then there is a t cube. So, that gives me a t square. So, when I integrate that gives me a t cube by 3 and that exactly cancels this object. So, I get 1. I get 1 to leading order. Good. So, that is that's good. Then to next leading order, I can just use this and this is what I will get. So, so, I just take this upstairs right? and so on. So, then you can calculate this. right? So, I will just write down the result here for small x. And of course, you can calculate it to any order by Taylor expansion. Let me just write the this is the behavior for uh, small x. Okay, good. So far, so good. Now, Please tell me what happens when x is very large. Now, we go to the opposite limits. So, what happens when x is very large? How would you approach this problem? So, x is very large. I mean, what do you expect then? I mean, it should be clear. What do you expect? What is the leading form of t? Sorry? 1 one by 1. So, if x is very, very large, uh, what is the function I will get on the right hand side? 1 person at a time. 
There are too many things. E, uh, just talk a bit loudly. No, no. There is no T and all here. There is only X here. Just tell everything. There is no T. This is just a function of X. Where is the T here? What is this when X is very large? What is it? I mean, I'm not. I mean, just tell me the approximate form if you wish. There's some number you can ignore, but what do you get? Constant? No. I mean, just look at it. It should be absolutely clear to you. What is the? Huh? No, 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 no. Okay. If x is very large, this integral can be replaced from zero to infinity, right? Okay. Now, what is the behavior of this uh, integral? I mean, <laughs> does it give you a finite number, infinite number, finite number? So, the leading behavior at large x is this finite number times 3 divided by x cube. Is there any disagreement? It is some number divided by x cube. No, no, no. I said x is very large. Correct? So, the leading behavior at large x is just some number divided by x cube. Okay, why is this integral finite? Is, is everybody clear on that? Why is this integral finite? Why are you speaking? Okay, anyway, he answered it. Anyway, for the lower limit and the upper limit, both the limits it converges. So, it is a finite integral, right? Okay, good. Okay, so in fact, you can even calculate this integral. So, um, thankfully, I could see the answer in check, uh, in Kersen uh, Wang, so I did not calculate the integral, but okay. Okay, so this is the leading piece. Now comes the next question. What is the next piece? What should I write? Plus what? How do you approach this problem? Now think carefully. What is the approximation I made? I replaced this integral from 0 to x, I replaced from 0 to infinity. So I made some approximation, right? So now uh, what is the subleading correction? Zero to one. Yeah. So there's no. There should not be one here. X is very large. So to calculate this, I just replaced x by infinity. But then I'm of course uh, making a. For smaller x values, we took another. Yes. Yes. Mm, that's correct. But for the smaller values of x, you got this kind of an expansion linear in x. Do you think this would be, for example, 1 by x? Do you think so? One by x to the power four. Why? What? Ha ha, that is already there. This is the leading behavior. Ah, okay, sorry, I, I get what you mean. So okay, do people think that this is the answer? How many people think this is the answer? Nobody thinks this is the answer. Just now you were thinking that this is the answer. This. <laughs> what is the answer? No, uh, let's think a bit, right? It's not very hard, right? How did we get the leading term? So where should I write? Let me write there. So, the way I got the leading term was I replaced this integral to 0 to infinity, some integral, right? But what is this integral actually? This is actually this, right? So, then effectively, ah, sorry, effectively I need to do something like this, some subtraction like this, right, of uh, this object. Now, can somebody tell me what should I put there? It is not 1 by x to the power 4. That's wrong. Now, look at this. This So, the piece that I am ignoring is from x to infinity, right? What? 
Why? Look at the look at the integrand as well. I mean, this is a mathematics problem, right? You don't look at half the expression in mathematics. You look at the full thing. I mean, this is something we even learn in school, right? Look at the full thing. Look at this, look at this. Look at the integral, that will tell you the answer. But you don't seem very confident, right? But it should be obvious, right? So, the integral is from x to infinity, right? So, x is always large because that, that's what my assumption is. So, then what is the leading behavior here? I can just, this guy is a very large number because x is large. So, I can take it to the numerator. So, it's roughly like e to the minus t and uh, from x to infinity. So, I can just pull out the e to the minus t. So, the correction goes like e to the minus x because this is a very small number, right? And how small is it is characterized by order e to the minus x, okay? Is this clear? So, this is actually faster, this is actually faster than any inverse power law that you could have written here, right? Just from the simple analysis. Then you can continue, okay, good. So, we got all this. So, we got the behavior of this function at large x and we got the behavior of this function at small x, right? Good. So, now I will just write the answers there and then we will immediately get the specific heat, right? Good. So, let me use both these things now, right? This and that. So, let me first use that power series. Then at high temperature, I get So, see, this is very nice because this recovers your classical answer. Right? This is your classical piece and then it of course gives all the corrections as well, right? as you go lower in temperature. Okay? Now, let us look at uh, that thing, x much, much greater than 1. So, see the energy is actually going as t to the power 4. I just use that, right? So, it is actually going as t to the power 4 and then there is a exponentially rapid correction on top of it, right? Good. So, now we know what the specific heat is. We just differentiate this and that with respect to temperature. This is for that and uh, for this, that is it. So, automatically we see that in the Debye approximation, the specific heat goes as T cube, right? For any temperature scale which is reasonably small compared to T sub D, the specific heat actually goes like that. In fact, it does not even need to be too small because the first correction is uh, exponentially small, okay. right? So, we also get the first correction here and the first correction here. Here actually it is straightforward to get more corrections as well, but it just gets more and more tedious. Okay. So, as I said, as I hope uh, I have conveyed to you, the universal physics that you should keep in mind here is the T cube. <laughs> this number, so see, 
as I said, in the insulator, the specific heat is A times T cube, right? So here, in the Debye approximation, the number A is 12 pi by 4 divided by 5 uh, times, uh, sorry, divided by T sub D whole cube, right? That's the number. But this might not be the real number. It might be for certain things, but it might not be the real number for certain other things. But whatever it is, this power would be correctly captured because the important physics which gives you this power is that the modes are gapless and they are linearly dispersing. That's the key point. Okay? Right. That's the key point. So, actually, now, uh, some after this was done, people also thought, oh, let me use uh, a combination of Debye theory and Einstein theory, right, and try to get the whole specific heat curve, right. So, what did they basically do? You see, the Debye theory is taking care of the acoustic modes, right? And then they took care of the optical modes using Einstein's approximation. And then they just patched up the two answers. And of course, that answer had a wider range of validity in temperature space. But of course, that still didn't change this T cube. But that is also a very nice interplay of using two approximations and patching them up to get an answer which is uh, relevant at a broader temperature scale. Right? So people did all kinds of stuff. And then in that last paper I showed you, people have done very clever stuff and they can just match everything from experiments. Right? Okay, good. So I am right on time. So I think this is a good point to stop. And uh, I'll take any questions you have. But at least we have proven one very important thing that the specific heat of insulators goes like this. And this is the physics of it. Okay. No, the experiments came a bit later. Oh, for some simple crystals, people appreciate that this thing should happen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, Goldstone theorem was not known. But you don't see. When I first learned this, I didn't know Goldstone theorem. K square. Hmm. Correct, correct. See, Debye's insight was, Debye's key insight was that he realized that if you are considering soft modes, like modes with very low energy, they have very long wavelength. And if you have a very long wavelength, Debye made a very reasonable assumption that you can ignore the crystal structure. And then it's like you have an isotropic solid. And for an isotropic solid, uh, people already knew that the uh, traveling excitations were sound waves. So that was his insight. Correct, correct. Is that what you are asking? No. Okay. Anyway, whatever he is asking, I think he got the answer. But you see, I mean, yeah. So the specific heat curves were of course known. Einstein even worried about this before Debye. But then we discussed what was wrong in his uh, thing. How much it was the sound move? That was his insight. Correct. Correct. Yes. Oh, like a, ha, ha, ha. No, no, but, uh, but see, this omega d cutoff is roughly related to this bandwidth. Yeah. Ha, ha, yeah, you can take this function. Yeah, yeah. For example. But still, you'll have a temperature scale like this. Yeah, you'll have a temperature scale like this. Uh, uh, that's related to the bandwidth, as I said. Yeah. Because it will deviate from linearity and it is related to the so bandwidth. The yeah, exactly. See, both in Debye's model, you have to cut it. And in this thing, you have to still cut it. So the relevant thing is the bandwidth. <coughs> oh, thank you for this question. Since I have minus one minute left, I can answer your question. See, uh, we should sometimes be surprised at our own calculations. Uh, yeah, okay. Let me tell you what is surprising. So, you said that I just took quadratic interactions. Of course, in my full model, there is 
cubic interactions, quartic interactions and so on. So then the harmonic oscillator problem does not remain harmonic, right? If the temperature increases, for example, because then the fluctuations become higher, right? And you can, you should then think of corrections to the model. So of course, uh, as I gave in one of the exercises, it's like a harmonic, uh, an harmonic oscillator. And then there are interactions between the different uh, modes at different k. There'll be terms like uh, a dagger k1, a dagger k2, a k3, a k4. For those who don't understand, ignore. But k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 would conserve momentum and so on and so forth. So there'll be interactions between the phonons as you raise the temperature. So now you can ask, does it actually, of course there are anharmonicities, does it actually lead to anything interesting? So the first part of your thing is, this result is not affected by that. Why? Because this is a low temperature result. At low temperatures, automatically you're back to the assumption that the fluctuations are small. So that part is okay. Of course, if you keep on cranking up the temperature, the crystal can even melt. Obviously, most crystals melt and that's an anharmonic effect for example. Second effect is which happens even before that, uh, you know most crystals when you heat them up there is an expansion of the length. In this kind of a harmonic theory, you can never get an expansion, that's impossible. I mean that you can just argue by symmetry. So you need anharmonicities for an expansion. The third thing which is also immediately clear is, if you just consider a harmonic theory like this, like uh, what I said. The harmonic theory captures one thing very correctly that it's T cube specific heat at low temperature, right? But then you can ask the question, does it capture everything correctly at small t? That's a perfectly valid question to ask. It captures one aspect of the physics correctly at low temperature. That is the behavior of the specific heat, how the energy changes and so on. But let me give you a quick answer of what it gets completely wrong, even at low temperature. So suppose you have a crystal and you make this harmonic approximation and you ask about uh, let's say thermal transport. Like you just pump in some heat and measure the thermal transport in the crystal, try to define some conductivity from that. In this approximation, we will get infinite conductivity in this harmonic approximation. But even at low temperature, if you do an experiment, you will always get finite conductivity. And that finiteness of conductivity comes due to the phonon-phonon uh, -phonon interactions that we have ignored. That's one reason. There are other reasons. There are some disorder effects, whatever, whatever. But if you take a completely clean model, phonon-phonon -phonon interactions make the infinite conductivity finite. So there are certain things which is incorrectly captured by this model, even at small temperature. But there are certain other things which are correctly captured. So whenever you make an approximation, you should always ask yourself that what am I capturing and what am I not capturing? Just because some one thing matches does not mean that everything else would match. That's very important to realize. Just remind me, what is this, the Wiedemann plus that says? Uh, the Heat, uh, right. Uh, electrical. Yeah, no, no, thermal by electrical. But here it's irrelevant because we are talking of insulators. But yeah, you are correct. I mean, wiedemann franz law essentially says that for metals, uh, what is carrying the current is also carrying the heat. Roughly that's the statement. But, but this is an insulator. Yeah. What point is the incorporated that is an insulator? Oh, very good. <laughs> I have not explained that to you. Uh, somewhere during the course of my lectures, I'll show that for a metal, in fact, this A times T cube will remain there because it's due to the crystal vibrations, but there'll be another term which is B times T. And this would come because of the uh, fluctuations of the electronic degrees. See, in an insulator, the electrons are not free to move. They, they, you need to pay a very high energy cost to move electrons around. So for an insulator, this piece is exponentially damped again for the electronic degrees. You see, because there's a big energy gap to moving electrons. But for a metal, electrons can move freely apart. So then you will get a non-exponential thing again for the electronic contribution. And that contribution, in fact, at low temperature, you see, this goes linearly and this goes as cube power of T. So this is bigger. Right? So this is more important. So we'll study that. So we can just think of a free electron system and we'll get this piece out of it. So the approximation I used is I can ignore this because it's an insulator.
करेक्ट करेक्ट सो वेन इट्स अ मेटल यू सी देर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड अ फर्मी सर्फिस राइट नाउ बेसिकली रफली द पिक्चर इज बट दिस इज वेरी क्रूड वील डू अ कैलकुलेशन रफली द पिक्चर इज सो दिस इज द फर्मी सर्फिस एंड द फर्मी ऑन्स विच आर सिटिंग नियर द फर्मी सर्फिस दे कैन हैव गैपलेस एक्सीटेशन लाइक दिस एंड दीज गैपलेस एक्सीटेशन गिव दिस Okay if there are no further questions then we break for lunch okay